19 office hours. My name is hey everyone and welcome to this week's COVID-19 office hours. My name is Natalie Matthews and I'm just going to spend a very brief moment going over some logistics before we get into our great content for the day today. So first and foremost, um, housekeeping slides. So please be reminded that we are recording the webinar today and both a copy of the recording, the slides, as well as the Q&A will all be posted to the link on the site uh, or on the screen right now on the HUD Exchange in just a few business days. Um, so please do look for that. Additionally, if you have audio issues at any point during the webinar, uh, we encourage you to connect through the phone. Uh, we have found that the phone line is often a little more stable in terms of audio. So please go ahead and um, use that phone number on the screen. We will be sure to put that in the chat box as well for you. Last but not least, in terms of um, ways to connect with us today, we absolutely want to hear from you throughout our time together, but you will not be able to verbally talk to us. We will instead be asking you to please send in questions, comments, feedback that you have for our presenters to um, everyone via the chat feature. You should see on your screen a little chat bubble. If you click on that, it'll open up the chat functionality for you. When you are sending in those messages, please, please be sure to send them to all participants. That is a way to ensure that it gets to our wonderful panelists as well as the attendees. And with that very, very brief overview, I'm going to now turn things over to Norm Suchar, the Director of HUD's Office of Special Needs Assistance Program. Norm? Thank you so much, Natalie. I quickly want to introduce our speakers today. We have a very, very full agenda uh, with a couple great uh, uh, outside presenters and some new resources to talk about. Uh, you will be hearing from HUD, you'll be hearing from me, Norm Suchar, uh, Brett Esters, Marlisa Grogan, Abby Miller, and Ebony Rankin. Uh, we have uh, some very special guests from the Council of State Government's Justice Center, uh, Thomas Coyne and Risa Hanneberg uh, will be giving a great presentation with a lot of fancy charts. Uh, and from the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, we have Richard Cho, uh, who will also be uh, using a lot of fancy charts. Uh, going on to the next slide, uh, we will have an update from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from Emily Mesitis. Uh, and we will have uh, uh, we have some friends from the Department of Veterans Affairs to help answer some questions, uh, and we will hear about some great new resources from HUD's technical assistance providers, Tara Reed and Anne McCready. Uh, so with that, I am going to turn things over to Emily Masaitis, and Emily is going to give us a, an update uh, from CDC. Emily? Hi everyone, this is Emily Mathitis with the Homelessness Unit in the COVID-19 Response at CDC. Um, next slide. So I just wanted to give you guys a situational update. We don't have, um, we don't have new resources to share as of right now, so I'll skip that part. But just situationally, um, as we've been following this every week and we've shown this slide over the past several weeks, um, We've seen a slight downward trajectory, but unfortunately what we're seeing now, and I'm sure you're hearing in the news, is that in a lot of locations, we are starting to see an upward trajectory. Just like we've talked about before, this is highly variable by local area. So there are some areas that continue in a, in a downward trajectory, some are remaining flat, but there are quite a number that are starting to increase. What we saw um, in the beginning of the outbreak was that there was a bit of a delay on when we saw cases increase among people experiencing homelessness compared to the general population. So we just wanna be extra careful, being um, very aware of the potential for an, a rise in cases among the people that we're serving. Uh, keep, um, keep your protections in place. Um, stay, stay vigilant, make sure that you um, have plans in place for in, in case um, community incidence is rising in your area and in case you start to see cases among the people that you're serving. As always, um, I'm available for questions and um, happy, happy to help out where I can. Thanks. And that's all for me. Uh, thank you so much, Emily. And I just want to uh, thank you. Uh, you've been on the, uh, obviously, many of our office hours calls and just 
you always provide us with great information, and it, we definitely appreciate the updates and all the, you know, fantastic uh, guidance and uh, information you've been able to give us. So thank you so much. Uh, next, we're going to uh, move to one of our guest presentations uh, from the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Uh, we're going to hear from Thomas Coyne and Risa Hanneberg. Uh, so, Thomas, I'm going to turn things over to you. Great. Thank you, Norm. I'm really glad to be here today. And again, my name is Thomas Coyne, and I'm a senior policy analyst here at the Justice Center and uh, working on our housing portfolio as it intersects criminal justice and behavioral health. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Risa Hannibal, who will introduce herself. So, um, and if you could introduce yourself. I'm sorry, Thomas, what did you say? Oh, and uh, Risa, if you could introduce yourself briefly. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were waiting for me to do it when I start uh, yeah. to do my presentation. Hi, everyone. It's Risa Hanneberg with the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I serve as the Deputy Division Director of our Behavior Health team that concentrates uh, on the um, Stepping Up initiative as well as uh, providing uh, TA assistance to those who are receiving justice and mental health collaboration program grants and also some county-based work. So thank you. Thank you, Thomas. Yeah, thanks, Risa. Um, so we at the Justice Center, we're a national nonprofit, um, nonpartisan organization. We represent officials across all three branches of local government uh, at State level, which lends us much like a continuous care to working across systems really in local communities. And on to the next slide. Uh, today we'll talk through the importance of addressing homelessness as people are leaving incarceration, uh, what we've seen from the communities we work with, and uh, discuss the Stepping Up initiative that Risa will uh, talk about, as well as leave you with some of the resources that the Council of State Government Justice Center has developed. And on to the next slide. Um, so addressing the importance of as people are leaving incarceration. Um, on the next slide, uh, really we know that it's so very important to housing first, to lower barriers, and really to provide choice in settings and in types of services. And on the next slide, you know, we see that uh, people are sometimes funneled into very narrow programs. Uh, because sometimes they're the only ones that will accept them. And also sometimes there's a lack of knowledge from our partners that we work with about continuum programs. Um, and really we want to help introduce choice uh, for people who are leaving incarceration uh, with the full continuum as we can. And on to the next slide, uh, you know, we see that uh, people in jail um, who are at risk of homelessness upon release, uh, they're often the people that are most likely to fall between the cracks of our public systems. And, you know, we've seen this in our work comparing jail information um, and HMIS with uh, sometimes people who are indicating that they might be experiencing homelessness on release, um, just not even in HMIS system, similar for uh, people who are going through the jail system. Um, you know, these are also people that have increased rates of behavioral health and chronic health issues compared to the general population. And really, they're the people who then are most likely to come into contact sometimes with shelters, but also emergency rooms with the police and returns to the jail, all of which really puts them at risk of developing uh, virulence related to COVID-19. And on the next slide, um, so a lack of um, housing and involvement, um, it really this disproportionately impacts uh, black communities, and this is across housing, criminal justice, and health. And especially as, as we've seen from some of the early data on mortality, um, we know that this really increases the risk of the risk of severe illness, again, with COVID-19. It's so very important during this time, and generally. And on to the next slide. Uh, we know that uh, housing stability is so very essential to reduce contact across this whole cycle, um, 
there's always points of uh, entry that can get people involved into the criminal justice system. But while there are also so many points of entry, there are also points along each way to divert people from the system so they don't necessarily face those extra barriers and collateral consequences that come from criminal justice involvement. And really, there's also that work to be done uh, up front in the, in the first step that's uh, not quite pictured here, which is really to strengthen crisis care and outreach that can really bring all of these services to bear uh, for people who are at risk or will experience homelessness upon um, release from child and prison and once they're in the community. On to the next slide. Um, so some of the things we've seen, um, and on the next slide, uh, we see Everyone else has seen uh, releases from jail and prison um, without really releasing far more people than ever before all at once, uh, sometimes with collaboration, sometimes without, and uh, sometimes releasing people as I think we found pre-COVID, but also uh, particularly pronounced now, sometimes releasing people when services aren't available. Um, so it's exacerbating really that existing cycle of um, disengagement from public systems. So we want to ensure really that people, especially those with complex care needs, are not being left in jails and prisons because there's not a place to house them um, or there's a lack of connections to continuums of care and that they don't fall between the cracks for public systems again. So on to the next slide. So some of how we've seen this um, be bridged and really see our community, the communities that we work with address this um, have been with that great collaboration between systems. So really engaging um, criminal justice and uh, potential justice partners in your communities. Um, so through our work through Stepping Up that Risa will talk about, um, as well as technical assistance that's funded uh, through the Melville Charitable Trust, we've really seen part of really promising relationships build um, at the county and continuum of care level that carry over right now, thankfully. Um, so some of that is just knowing who to talk to, um, and some of it's getting connected with the right groups, like stepping up initiatives or reentry councils. And some of it um, is really then building on those relationships to bring really innovative work that's being done, such as in Delaware County, Ohio, we're seeing that the jail there and their staff are able to really connect people um, in the community, uh, to connect people who are in jail with their community partners via um, teleconnections and video conferencing, and all of that really was made possible with their existing relationships they had built prior to COVID. Um, but it's really a time to continue building those relationships to those really interesting ways of in-reach um, that others can keep going. And what we've seen also is that our criminal justice partners that we work with in communities when we're working with large groups that include behavioral health and criminal justice and housing partners is that they're eager to lever with leverage what funding they have. So for example, uh, local stepping up groups have really been integral to some of these successes we've seen, such as bringing to bear additional permanent supportive housing. Um, like for example, in Cuyahoga County in Ohio, they've uh, brought state funding that's intended for the criminal justice system, um, able to bear then uh, to the continuum of care and local behavioral health partners so they can provide new permanent supportive housing. And so, stepping up, mentioned a couple times, uh, the net nationwide initiative to reduce the number of people in jail with serious mental illness. At, and it's just such an important avenue to this. And I'll turn it over to Risa to discuss the stuff in Thank you, Thomas. And thank you, everyone, for joining today. And I really appreciate this opportunity to just uh, spend a few minutes uh, with you all talking about the Stepping Up initiative. Uh, this might be a slightly different audience today than uh, what I have presented to you before, so I'm hoping that we might get some uh, new interest. Uh, the Stepping Up initiative uh, was launched, actually, we just celebrated our fifth anniversary, and it's a national initiative to reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. And the partner organizations for Stepping Up is the National Association of Counties, the American Psychiatric Association Foundation, and the Council of State Governments Justice Center. Next slide. So as I said, we, we just completed five years. 
Um, we are happy to report that we are over 500 counties now that have uh, signed a resolution to participate. Um, this represents 43 states, 47% of the population, um, and just trying to address that high number of individuals um, churning through jails every year with, with a serious mental illness. And as you'll see the other box in the middle there, 21 innovator counties, these are counties across the country that have really been leading the way in the stepping up um, process and, and implementing the framework. So we really use them um, as our resources to guide other counties and also the initiative. Next slide. Stepping up, I'm just gonna very quickly go through this. I could spend a, an hour or more, but um, we have this fundamental document, reducing the number of people with mental illnesses in jail, um, based on six questions. This is really the framework for the Stepping Up initiative. And as Thomas said a few times, the Stepping Up uh, locations across the country who have embraced these six questions and follow this framework, um, as you will see when we talk a little bit more today, um, really is also a, a, the perfect uh, forum for also looking at homelessness, looking at you know the, the next steps to take when an individual is released from jails and incarceration, and really it's, it's really geared toward the system-wide approach. Um, many times communities, it's the first time where criminal justice and behavior health leaders have stakeholders have sat down together to really do some, some cross-system planning. Um, just quickly making sure your leadership is committed uh, within the jail that we immediately conduct timely screening and assessments to, uh, with validated tools to finally get a handle on the, the level and the numbers of individuals coming into the justice system with a serious mental illness, very much based on da using da data and setting baselines, uh, completing process inventories, many of these um, you will recognize as being a sequential intercept mapping then moving towards prioritizing next steps and tracking progress. Next, next slide. Um, the work is really focused around tracking what we call the four key measures. Um, I wish it was only four data points. I mean, uh, there's, a, there's obviously several other data points that would go into how you would track these four measures, but it centers around reducing the number of people with mental illness booked into jail, so reducing that booking. For those who come into jail, we want to reduce or, and shorten their average length of stay. Most of the data we see across the country is if an individual is booked into jail with um, SMI, they tend to stay up to twice as long as their counterparts in the general population of the jail. And then I think also important to the, the presentation today, but increasing connections to treatment and supports in the community upon release. Um, Thomas pointed um, to several jurisdictions doing great work in this. We see that jails have really um, grown in their reach in terms of um, their roles, the, um, employing staff, bringing embedding staff from behavior health and mental health centers, so forth, in making sure those connections to care are in place um, prior to discharge. And then overall, just reducing recidivism, recidivism rates or the rebooking of those individuals coming back into the jail and certainly looking at those who are churning and are the, that high utilizer population that are not only um, using um, the jails but also the emergency rooms, shelters, et cetera, that high utilizer population of multiple systems. Next slide. And I'm not gonna go over this, but I just really like this slide because it helps you see that after you go through those six questions, you've looked at your data, you've looked at your processes, your capacity levels, how it all can circle back and, and to these four key measures is the kinds of next steps and, and where you would prioritize, um, you know, those probably very um, uh, low levels of funding, et cetera, that you could maybe, you know, redirect into this kind of work. So just some ideas there, suggestions under how, if you were picking or going to say we want to target, for example, jail bookings, that you'll see that many of the the kinds of responses, policies, practices would be focused on that police level contact with an individual and, and hopefully avoiding an arrest and, and entering the justice system. Next slide. And I just want to close with a few slides here that will just um, uh, let you realize that we have a, a, a very, very robust website, steppinguptogether.org. Um, the, the document I refer to, the six questions framework is here, all kinds of um, case studies. Um, next slide. 
Yeah, we have a project coordinator's handbook that uh, will follow along the whole entire frame framework step by step. And a strategy lab, these are just all different kinds of tools and resources um, if you would go to stepuptogether.org. Also, if you go there and you click on counties, you'll be able to see if your home county is a participant in the Stepping Up initiative. And I think, um, Thomas, did you have a, one more slide? Or? Yeah, um, I just wanted to talk briefly about some of the COVID-specific resources that the Justice Center has put out. Um, first and foremost is actually one that uh, Risa authored. Um, develop an off-the-shelf checklist for incorporation um, into the reentry process and this is really integral to help uh, maybe your jail partners, this might be a way in with your jail partners, um, really to help them get set up for reentry during COVID-19 and ask questions that they can just drop right into the reentry re process. Um, so again, it could be a starting point with uh, potential partners or help build those relationships and really help them get thinking too about questions to be asking as they're leaving. Um, and in addition, we have a collaborative um, assessment um, that gets at some of the, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, on the previous uh, slide, um, we have a, a draft collaborative assessment that uh, tries to get at some of the important policies, processes, and partnerships that we've seen um, help facilitate connections as people are leaving incarceration between jails and optimal service providers. And, and again, with the hopes that these, um, these areas are really ones that will help uh, build these relationships and also align policies, both in the short term and in the long term, really, because that's, um, as this emergency eventually comes down, these will be things that uh, I think everyone would like to be in place in one way or another. Um, and then on the next slide, we have just additional general resources from the Justice Center, as well as our parent organization, the Council of State Government. And thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Norm. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas. Thank you, Risa. Uh, great presentation and it, just a ton of great resources there. We have tried to put as many of them in the chat box as we can, so uh, feel free to click on over there and, and uh, look at some of those resources. Uh, next, I'm very pleased to introduce Richard Cho from the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness. Uh, and uh, Richard, I know you have some great content, so I'm just going to turn things over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Norm, uh, and good to be with you all um, at HUD, as well as uh, my former colleagues at the Council of State Government Justice Center, the little reunion for me. Um, I want to present a little bit about some of the work that uh, my organization, the Connecticut Coalition to End Homelessness, was doing um, even prior to the COVID pandemic with regard to trying to address the intersection between homelessness and people who are involved in the justice system in Connecticut. Uh, and then uh, what actually the COVID pandemic has done to, uh, frankly, accelerate um, our work um, leading to uh, an, a new initiative that we've just recently launched, which I'll talk a little bit about. Um, just to provide a little bit more context, um, uh, my organization is, uh, we, we represent the homeless service system. So we are um, sorry for my dog in the background. Uh, we uh, represent uh, homeless services and we advocate on their behalf. Um, in addition, we also uh, play a role in administering the statewide HMIS system. So we have access to statewide HMIS data, which also has a release of information, which enables us to do data sharing with other systems. Uh, uh, we also provide training and technical assistance. So on the next slide. Um, so I began uh, uh, as the chief executive officer for CCH uh, in the fall of, of 2018, and in January of 2019, uh, we had a new uh, 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 administration in our state. Uh, by the way, I wanted to just give a little bit of context. Our, our, uh, the state of Connecticut is a little bit strange. You just heard a little bit from Risa and from Thomas about um, stepping up as a county initiative. Connecticut's um, different in that we don't have county government. We are one single uh, state government and then 169 separate municipalities. Uh, in addition, our criminal justice system is uh, whereas most places you have state prisons and then you have county jails uh, or, or city jails, uh, in Connecticut, um, we have one unified system. So our State Department of Corrections oversees um, local jails where people are booked um, and then also state prisons. And so uh, when I talk about prisons, I'm really talking about uh, prisons that serve as either uh, jail facilities that are holding people prior to their trial um, or, or folks that are sentenced. Uh, so I, um, let's go back to January of 2019. Um, we, uh, I had the uh, interest in looking at what is the, the specific overlap between 
people who are coming out of prison and were actually um, uh, in, in, in our homeless system in our state. And so we were able to match our data, our HMIS data, with our state's Department of Corrections data. Um, and so we sent over records of anybody who used shelters in the last three years. Um, Connecticut uh, homeless populations, 85% uh, sheltered, about 15% unsheltered. So we sent over records of people who used shelters in the last three years. That was about 17,000 people. Um, that was matched against the historical DOC database. Uh, goes back probably 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, that includes about 450,000 unique um, individuals. Uh, and what we found was that roughly half of the people who used shelters over the last three years had some lifetime DOC history. So that's not inconsistent with what we've found uh, from national data. What we did find was that 20% of the people who, are, who use shelters um, had been released from jail or prison in, within the last three years. So we're not talking about being in prison 10, 15 years ago and all of a sudden they're homeless today, but really people who had very recent um, histories of incarceration uh, what that amounts to is that uh, approximately every year, about one-fifth of the people who are homeless in our state are people who've, been, who've come out of a DOC facility within the last three years, and often it's uh, more so in the last year rather than um, many years ago. We also found, you know, we often think about people being discharged from a long prison sentence and then they wind up homeless. Uh, we actually found that roughly half of this, this overlap cohort uh, were serving a sentence in their last DOC stay. The other half were actually released from court um, just um, on a jail uh, booking, but that uh, either their case was dismissed or they were released um, out of court, uh, or they might have been sentenced to probation, but they were released directly from court. So really talking about a half uh, people who were just spending time uh, on a pretrial detention basis and then uh, released from courts. We also found that of the uh, sentence population, so half of the folks that were sentenced, they were serving sentences of less than two years. Uh, and many of them were released at their end of sentence. Um, in the state of Connecticut, if you are serving a sentence under two years, uh, DOC has the authority to release you at 50% of your sentence completion. Um, so they can uh, release you uh, at their own discretion, uh, which that, that's a, a fact that will become important later. But 80% of the people who are serving a sentence and who subsequently became homeless were actually um, uh, released at their end of sentence. So they basically maxed out their entire prison term uh, we thought likely because of the fact that they had no stable housing uh, and therefore they couldn't be released earlier on. Um, so you can see how homelessness ends up uh, leading to a disproportionately longer stay in prison for people who are sentenced. Uh, we also found that uh, about two thirds of them were homeless prior to their last DOC release. So these aren't people who are newly could becoming homeless, but actually 28%, so almost a third uh, became homeless uh, only after their most recent DOC release. So think about Two thirds of this group are kind of cycling in and out of prisons and and are and and homelessness, uh, but then every year another third get added uh, to uh, to our homelessness ranks. Uh, and again, you could see the pattern of 80% had two or more DOC stays, 59% uh, had three or more, 44% had four or more stays. So we're talking about people with many many um, DOC stays. And one of the other other things that was interesting was looking at the age at which people first became in Department of, uh, of Corrections. We found that uh, a, a significant number, 57%, had their first um, ever um, prison involvement uh, at, the, in, at, at adolescence, so at the age uh, of, of um, when they were youth. Um, and currently, they're in their 30s, 40s, and 50s. And so you think about people who um, were involved in the justice system as adolescents and now have been on a decades-long cycle. And you can start thinking about how potentially school discipline policies, school suspension led to uh, you know, their involvement in the juvenile justice system, which then led to the adult system, and now they're on a cycle between homelessness and incarceration. So you hear about the school-to-prison pipeline. Well, there's actually perhaps a school-to-prison-to-homelessness pipeline as well. On the next slide. I'm going to run through this fairly quickly because I know I'm limited on time. Um, you can just see uh, a vast majority of these are, folks are non-white. Um, about 60-something percent are non-white. Uh, or, or close to 60%, uh, majority are male, 80% um, male, 19%. Um, this, this shows the, the group in the prison homelessness overlap. Uh, you can see uh, they're disproportionately non-white, uh, overwhelmingly male, um, very similar to the kind of racial disparities we see in both the homeless system as well as in the cr criminal justice system. Next slide. Um, uh, I covered this already. This just kind of shows how many of the group uh, of the folks were uh, um, homeless prior to their last DOC admission, and you could see it ranges if you were unsentenced, so therefore serving only a jail stay in your last DOC sentence, um, you were very likely to be homeless prior to your DOC, uh, but you were still likely if you were sentenced. So um, two thirds, again, were homeless prior to their last DOC um, admission. Next slide. Uh, we looked at a couple of interesting case studies just to sort of understand the life cycle of, of this involvement. And so this, this slide and the next slide just kind of shows 
um, how one man's uh, experience of, of cycling through the criminal justice system. Uh, this is an individual, we'll call him Paul. That's a pseudonym, of course. Um, he's currently 37 year old. Uh, th uh, he's a high school graduate, um, has had a shaky employment history, um, has some clear disabling conditions. Uh, he was first arrested again as a, a young person at age of 26. He's had 17 total arrests in 11 years in eight different locations in our state, um, mostly uh, misdemeanors, but a few felonies. Uh, and you could see he began, uh, he first touched our homeless system in 2010, uh, and that was 10 years ago, uh, and he's basically bounced in and out. He, he actually accrued enough homelessness to achieve chronic homelessness status in 2016. Um, the last we checked, he was uh, incarcerated in DOC, slated to be released uh, in April of, of, of uh, 2019, and um, I haven't looked back on and see where this particular individual is, but here's an individual who literally bounces back and forth. On the next slide, we kind of just um, kind of illustrated the life cycle over a timeline, so you could just see how many times this person was in jail. Um, the phone calls represent when they made a call to our coordinated entry system, which is run by our state's two-in-one system, and then uh, how they uh, uh, how this person used shelter, uh, wound up in jails. Uh, uh, they were actually assessed. They received a VI spadad in March 2016, uh, and so uh, there actually are some instances where. Um, this individual called 211 asking for shelter that morning by that afternoon was in DOC. And so really shows, I think, the illustration of uh, how um, really this, this cycle is, is really severe um, and also the power of being able to put together HMIS data with, with Department of Corrections data. Um, I'm seeing all the comments in the chat about the dog. I'm really sorry about the background noise here. So uh, let's keep moving. Um, so uh, we had actually planned out a strategy in the last year. We had received some support from the Tau Foundation, the Melville Charitable Trust, and others uh, to really pursue a comprehensive approach to trying to break the cycle of homelessness and incarceration. Uh, we had shaped a couple of pieces of legislation, uh, one of which was to require Department of Corrections and our um, judicial branch to screen systematically every single inmate for housing status and to look for people who are at risk of homelessness. Uh, as well as to work uh, closely with our Department of Housing to create a new um, housing intervention that would be using criminal justice dollars. We also um, helped to shape a bill that would um, prevent landlords from discriminating against people on the basis of a criminal record, uh, but where they would have to uh, conduct a, a individualized assessment that also took into account how long ago that offense was before they could deny somebody housing, um, as well as some other factors. Uh, we also started providing training to probation officers and to Department of Correction on how to screen for housing status and also do some housing navigation. Um, and then we are in the process of trying to leverage and piece together state and federal funding to provide a flexible rental assistance and case management program, essentially a rapid rehousing model for people who are leaving Department of Corrections and would likely to become homeless. Next slide. Um, so, and then all of a sudden, uh, so our legislative session, we had these bills that were approved for our housing committee. They were about to be voted out onto the floor for a general vote. Um, we were having great uh, uh, progress with our state uh, criminal justice agencies. And all of a sudden, uh, March 7th, the first case of COVID-19 arrives in our state and everything kind of comes to a halt. Our legislative session is halted. Uh, uh, all of a sudden our homeless shelter system is disrupted. And by the way, I had to drop everything I was doing, working on focusing on helping to protect people experiencing homelessness with a lot of help from HUD as well as from Dr. Nusaitis. So thanks to a shout out to Emily who's on the call. Uh, and what we did in our state was to move about 50% of our sheltered population uh, into hotels um, to spread people out. Um, and we also vastly reduced any new shelter admissions. We tried to step up um, shelter diversion resources as well. Um, and, and at the same time, um, we had some really fierce advocacy from criminal justice reform advocates in our state putting pressure on our state to try to release as many uh, inmates from prison as well to try to prevent uh, COVID outbreaks within the prison population. Uh, in fact, there was a lawsuit that the ACLU filed with our state uh, to try to release uh, uh, folks. Um, uh, even in that time period, even as the state was getting uh, pressure from outside to reduce the number of people in prisons, we also saw a historic drop in, in, in prison admissions. In the last four months, uh, we've seen, I think, a 30% drop in our prison population um, over the weekend, our state is projecting that we will have under 10,000 inmates, which is the lowest um, it's been since the late 80s. Um, and so really the pandemic has had transformative effects both on our homeless system as well as on our state prison system. Um, but coupled with that, um, our state Department of Corrections um, was very worried about the people who were hitting their end of sentence. Um, they knew shelters were not taking admissions. Halfway houses are also trying to decompress and take fewer admissions. 
um, they had really basically nowhere to send people who were hitting their end of sentence and they knew were, were going to be homeless. These are folks that they've been, again, trying to come up with a discretionary release plan for, but um, the lack of housing was this limiting factor. Um, so they called us up and said, you know what, we actually have uh, about 140,000 initially, and you can go to the next slide, um, in um, justice assistance grants funding. This is JAG, burn JAG uh, money that the, uh, every state criminal justice agency has at their disposal. And initially they said, we have 140,000. Can you do something to help folks over the next two months uh, who are being released from end of sentence to prevent their homelessness? And so we quickly patched together a program and recruited providers uh, to work with us uh, and figured out a way that, uh, you know, clients that are identified by DOC uh, um, would be referred to us uh, and then we would work um, on, on fielding those two providers. We wanted to make sure that DOC wouldn't just um, send everybody um, who was hitting their end of sentence to us. And so we worked with them to make sure that they were doing due diligence to exhaust all other housing possibilities, figure out if people had family connections, um, also determine if people were um, going to release from prison uh, to a subsequent probation supervision term or where they were going back to probation supervision and to make sure that probation was in the hook and if they could also help resolve. So the idea was kind of like, let's triage, let's make sure that these resources would go to those that most needed them. Uh, and, and basically, uh, since then, we were able to leverage additional funding. So the state added another $40,000. Um, we got a grant from the Hartford Foundation at uh, $140,000, uh, as well as some uh, municipal ESG money that came in through the CARES Act. So the city of New Haven kicked in $26,000 through their allocation of ESG to, to contribute to this program. Um, and then on the next slide, you'll see um, what we've essentially done is receive referrals from Department of Corrections. Uh, about 68 people were referred between April 1st and May 15th. Uh, it's about uh, 59 referrals per month. Um, we've been continuing to do this, so I have some updated numbers um, that we will uh, um, provide update. We extrapolate that at, at that pace, we're talking about about 708 individuals that would be discharged from DOC and identified as um, likely to become homeless if not for this assistance. Next slide. Uh, and. Um, uh, we found about half of them were uh, on probation supervision, the other half were not. Um, again, as I mentioned, we, we try to make sure that if probation's in the picture, that they also are responsible for trying to identify some potential housing. They also have their own portfolio of transitional housing that they have at their disposal. Uh, one of the things we found is that it's almost impossible to get line up true permanent rental housing the day of people's release. So if there isn't already some form of transitional housing that probation has, or if they're not under probation, uh, we've actually been using flexible systems to cover a few nights of a motel room, um, and then uh, from there, um, we'll try to line up um, permanent housing. Um, next slide. Um, this is just the age distribution. A uh, vast majority of them are uh, in that uh, kind of uh, middle age cohort. Um, uh, uh, and um, uh, it also, uh, I think there's a smaller number that are, are, are younger. Next slide. Um, again, see the disproportionality here. You'll note that about 51% of these are folks who are uh, non-white, um, which is actually less disproportionate than the overall criminal justice system. And one of the things that we found is that many of the folks that are being released from prisons uh, uh, at, during the COVID pandemic were, uh, were more white than the, the overall DOC population. And what we found, I think, is, is that the lack of housing uh, within that are, is available to black and brown communities uh, is one of the reasons why there's, there's this disproportionality in, in releases. So um, one can think about uh, race and equity concerns related to, uh, you know, the, how housing actually ends up contributing to people staying in prison longer. And so um, it, it's another issue that we need to, to do something about. Um, next slide. Um, we worked with DOC over the, at the beginning, you know, we were getting referrals that was like three days before people's release time. As you can imagine, it's impossible to really um, ensure that you don't lose uh, track of somebody once they're released from prison. So over the last uh, two months or so, we worked with DOC to try to get um, those referrals early on as possible. So it's now on average 22 days that we're getting a referral. It gives us a little bit more lead time to give a heads up to our providers. Um, next slide. Um, we're, we have data from Department of Corrections own mental health, medical, and, and substance use assessments. Um, majority of the folks here who've been referred have, um, have, have certainly substance use needs. A significant number, about roughly half of them, have m medical and mental health needs as well. So we're talking about a fairly vulnerable population. Um, but again, what, m most of what we've been doing is, is providing a rapid rehousing level assistance. Uh, we are also looking at how to tap some of the existing turnover in supportive housing that is available to, to once people are housed to see if we could refer them uh, into supportive housing. Again, these are folks who, uh, many of them are having short stays in prison and have a homelessness history prior to their incarceration. Um, next slide. 
Um, uh, good news is a lot of them are coming out with a Medicaid card. Uh, most of them have a DSS number and have healthcare coverage, uh, which is uh, helpful both for uh, facilitating um, COVID testing and potential um, healthcare access, uh, but just in general also having access to services. Um, next slide. Um, and again, uh, these are folks who uh, uh, kind of mirror uh, what I mentioned before. Um, the folks who've been referred to this program, uh, about 45% of them have had at least one episode of homelessness, um, but uh, uh, roughly a fifth of them have had, uh, you know, uh, three or more episodes. Uh, and so uh, you're, we are talking about people who have been on this cycle of homelessness and incarceration. Um, and then I think this might be the last slide here. Um, and so this just kind of shows for the first uh, uh, 68 people who are referred, uh, we've been able to identify housing, permanent housing solutions for 71% of them. Uh, another 21% were in the process of, of moving from some temporary housing, whether that's a hotel room or transitional housing to permanent housing. Uh, we had 8% that actually declined any assistance. So that's um, uh, sort of uh, gives you a sense of where things are. We're continuing to take referrals. Um, we are hopeful that the state um, has access to a whole other pool of money through the CARES Act, uh, which is known as the uh, Coronavirus Emergency Support Fund that actually comes from the Department of Justice to state criminal justice agencies, CESF it's known as, uh, and that is another flexible pool of money um, and the state is considering looking at investing a significant portion of those CSF funds uh, to expand this program. So again, we have enough funding that will get us through roughly July, uh, but we're, we're looking for a much more uh, significant investment going forward. Um, I should have mentioned, um, you know, we, we, it's really important to think of this as a flexible fund. Uh, so we are able to pay for hotels, but also primarily security deposits, uh, rental assistance. Um, we are in this interesting uh, moment where we have a very small amount of funds and we have to play this game of determining, are we going to take more referrals and commit forward more rental assistance, um, or uh, do we stick to the commitments we've made to provide people four to six or six to nine months of rental assistance um, through Rapid Rehousing? So um, we are fingers crossed that the state is going to invest to scale this program, which would enable us to receive more referrals as well as meet the rental assistance needs of the population that we've already received. So with that, I'll, I'll take a pause there and looking forward to the conversation. Great, thank you so much, Richard. A uh, lot of great information there, and I'm sure uh, you'll be getting a lot of questions a little later on. Uh, but before that, I wanna turn things over to Marlisa Grogan from the SNAPS office, and she's gonna talk about some of the next steps in accessing uh, ESG CARES Act funds. Marlisa? Hi, can you hear me? Yep, you okay, sound great. great. We, uh, if you've joined office hours before, you, this will sound very familiar, but please do not wait to submit your substantial amendments, those of you who are ESG CV recipients. Um, if you haven't submitted your amendment for round one, uh, please do so. You can include both rounds one and two in your um, annual action plan submission or amendment. Do not wait because there are immediate needs that I'm sure you all have identified and that we're definitely aware of. Um, Rapid rehousing, and one example is transitioning people from non-congregate shelter. Non-congregate shelter to continue congregate shelter decompression, and one that we have not mentioned but is so, so important, HMIS, because with ESG CV comes additional reporting, quarterly reporting, and your HMIS leads will need additional funding to be able to ramp up and fulfill their increased role in CAPER reporting. So please do not forget to budget for HMIS. It's a critical component of your, e, your ESG CV program. And with that, I will turn it back to you, Norm. Great, thank you so much, Marlisa. I wanna uh, to, uh, sort of switch to a different topic and talk about some uh, additional resources that are out there. So if we could go to the next slide, please. One is, uh, and we'll put this, the link to the document up in the chat box, but. We just published uh, HUD in partnership with, um, with FEMA, just published a document that just sort of talks about funding issues related to non-congregate sheltering and, uh, and how you should think about different funding sources move, uh, working together, uh, specifically about FEMA public assistance. So if you're getting FEMA funding for hotels, for example, uh, that's category B FEMA assistance, or if your community is getting it, I should say. Uh, and then there are uh, CDBG coronavirus funds and ESG coronavirus funds, and all of these can kind of pay for this, uh, some, of the, some similar activities. 
So uh, this sort of lays out kind of an order of thinking through how to, uh, which funds to use for different activities. Uh, certainly the initial request for non-congregate sheltering, I think most uh, states and communities have at this point uh, uh, applied for FEMA funds for non-congregate sheltering. And uh, so that's, that's definitely a good place to start. We have some, uh, actually the document that you see the link to uh, also uh, has some information or links to some information about how you can apply for FEMA funding if uh, you're one of the few communities that hasn't done that yet. Uh, so that FEMA can cover the majority of that, uh, uh, of those costs. But if you have somebody who isn't covered, who's experiencing homelessness, but uh, isn't covered under your FEMA assistance, uh, you can certainly use uh, the CDBG and ESG as you have to make sure they're obviously eligible for ESG funding. But those are two resources to pay for hotels, dorm rooms, those other kinds of non-congregate uh, shelter uh, approaches. Um, at some point, uh, you know, FEMA your, in your community, FEMA assistance may end uh, for non-congregate sheltering. Uh, and in some cases, you may want to continue that for a little longer. Uh, you can certainly use ESG CV. Again, you have to make sure people are eligible uh, and CDBG CV for that. Um, the document also talks a little bit about uh, transitioning individuals from non-congregate sheltering to other uh, more stable situations, preferably housing, of course. Uh, and uh, ESG and CD and, and CDBG CD are available for that. And then also, um, you know, and just sort of helping wind down your non-congregate sheltering FEMA funded non-congregate sheltering. Uh, because, you know, if your FEMA funding ends and you sort of still need a little more time to help people transition again, trying to get everyone uh, possible uh, to housing, uh, then, then you can certainly, again, use ESG CD funds and CDBG CD funds for that. So the document, uh, it's not too long. Uh, I encourage you to check it out. Um, moving on to the next slide, we have a couple updates about the Treasury, Department of Treasury Coronavirus Relief Fund. Um, the, the, the Department of Treasury just published some FAQs about their Coronavirus Relief Fund. I want to talk about two of them. We'll put the link in the notes, but their website isn't working right now, so you can't actually access it right now. Um, but you can, these notes are literally copied and pasted from that, and at some point, presumably, they will fix whatever technical issue they're having, uh, and you'll be able to access those. But uh, there is a question that uh, many people have had uh, about whether you can use coronavirus, uh, sorry, treasury funds for homelessness prevention, and uh, you can obviously read the answer here, but the short answer is yes. Uh, treasury funds are an eligible, uh, are, uh, homelessness prevention is an eligible use of treasury funds, uh, so definitely something you should be looking at and looking into. Uh, I know many people, and we've had some good chat uh, comments about, uh, about homelessness prevention, uh, this is a great resource for homelessness prevention and strongly encourage everyone to look into it. Uh, going on to the next slide, please. We've also had a question about can you use Treasury uh, coronavirus relief funds as a cost share for your FEMA? Um, and the answer is yes. And again, there's some information uh, there about uh, sort of, well, you can read the resource. Um, and again, uh, hopefully that link will be up soon. We will. Uh, you know, in the HUD exchange, obviously have links to that and such, and uh, encourage you to check those, uh, those um, FAQs out. So moving on to the next slide, please. Uh, we are, I'm going to turn things over to two of our great uh, technical assistance uh, providers uh, who are going to talk through some new resources we've published over the past uh, week or so. We know we're throwing out a lot of resources to you and uh, we just want to use some time to just give you a sense of, of some of the things we've published out there. So uh, Tara Reed and Anne McCready are going to uh, present here, and I'm going to turn things over to Tara first. Uh, Tara? Uh, actually, I think you're turning it to me. Sorry, Norm, we switched up on you. Oh, um, great. great. I was talk. keeping you on your toes. Um, so the um, 
first thing we wanted to share with you is uh, a resource that when you click, uh, I think we're going to provide a link in the um, chat, that this is actually a handout that you could print out and put in your um, workspaces. These are what we're going to overview for you today are two new resources that we hope will be helpful to the actual like and direct service users um, to use in, in the, the case managers to use potentially directly. So this first one is a visual um, that is based on OSHA guidance of the, when to use the sort of medical grade PPE and when to use a cloth or fabric covering. Um, there, we're hoping that this guidance helps people uh, feel confident in their workspaces as they return to in-person um, in, in, as opposed to remote work for those who had been working remotely to assuage some anxiety they might feel about being in shared space with folks who may have higher risks of, um, uh, you know, having contracted COVID. So, um, again, a, a resource we hope you will share, print out, and put in a visual space so people can remember when to use which uh, resource. And then if we can have our next slide, I will turn it over to Tara. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm making sure that I'm fully unmuted before I dive in. Um, my name is Tara with App Associates. Um, so as Ann said, these new resource documents that we as HUDTA, I guess we're really hopeful that they can be helpful to all homeless services providers in your work during these, I will call them complicated times. Um, the document that you should be seeing right now is kind of our wellness checklist for client engagement. Um, this document is meant to be a guide for those working with individuals experiencing homelessness on the varied um, and many different aspects of well-being. We wanted to make sure that in the conversations that were being had, whether in the field or remotely, that the person was being addressed kind of as a whole, they were being looked at holistically, and all the different aspects which could be impacting their lives right now were being, take, were being taken into consideration. Um, the content for this document was based upon SAMHSA's dimensions of wellness, and those primary dimensions are physical, intellectual, emotional, social, spiritual, vocational, financial, and lastly, environmental. Um, the overarching intention is for this document to be used as, as a quick at-a-glance guide for case managers for, or for other support staff to use when meeting with clients, once again, both virtually and or in person. Um, the goal of the one sheet is to provide kind of those quick prompts um, and possible questions within the different dimensions to help open up conversations about where a person and individual might be struggling. So sample questions are, how are they sleeping? Are they worrying more? Have the new regulations, very sorry, my doorbell. Uh, have the new regulations with mask and travel restrictions cause them any distress and or has the pandemic um, impacted their income? Um, the one disclaimer that we have with this document, and I believe it's kind of with all of our documents that reference kind of interactions with our clients during these difficult times, is just to please remember that as you use this, um, to always be sensitive about the information that is gathered and to ensure that you've got, the, you've got a plan in place for following up with additional support, services, and or resources whenever appropriate. And that's all that I have. Great, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we're going to scroll through some slides. We have time for a couple quick questions. Uh, we sort of uh, committed to, uh, we had a vote last week and decided uh, that people, or well, people voted and decided they liked having, uh, uh, cutting these down to an hour. So uh, we just have a couple of questions we'll take. I want to direct the first one to Emily from Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. We had some questions about what do we know and not know about the prevalence of COVID-19 among homeless people uh, in any areas of the country? Uh, do you mind giving us a quick rundown of what we know and don't know? Sure, thanks for that question. That's um, That question, takes up a lot of our thought in our unit because that's a that's a, a prime piece of data that we're really looking for. 
So when, we're, when we think about how um, cases are normally reported through public health, they're reported through a laboratory, and then the public health department follows up um, sometimes through medical records. So that actually means that often it's very difficult to ascertain if someone is homeless in our normal reporting processes. So what we have been doing from our unit side is um, using a variety of data sources to try to triangulate what's happening among people experiencing homelessness. And this can be situational awareness from partners, from people that we know are working on the ground. Um, we have some information that comes in through emergency departments that tells us some overall trends um, among people who are experiencing COVID-like illness. So we don't have a confirmation, a laboratory confirmation, but we know that the trends follow the general population trends among people experiencing homelessness. So the, the dissatisfying answer is that we don't have an exact number, but we do have a general sense. We do know that um, transmission is high or can be high in shelters. Um, we do know that um, there certainly have been, um, there have been cases among people experiencing homelessness following the trend of the general population. We don't have that exact number for those reasons. So we're gonna continue um, working to make our data systems better and it's certainly a goal to get um, as good an estimate as possible. Great, thank you so much, Emily. Uh, and this actually flows into our last question or topic that we, I want to talk about. Uh, we've had some questions about why we've... Sorry about that. Uh, my audio cut out there. Um, so we've had some questions about uh, why we're emphasizing rapid rehousing so much. And I think Emily's comments there point to one of the reasons we've been focused uh, so much on uh, rehousing people, particularly in high risk situations like, uh, like congregate shelters where people are sharing sleeping areas and like uh, unsheltered locations where uh, you know, hygiene and, and healthcare may not be so great. Uh, is because we do really see the need to use CARES Act funding to try to prevent the spread of uh, the prevent the spread of COVID, as well as uh, you know help people move to uh, to housing. And we know that you know having your own housing unit is the safest place uh, somebody can be in the middle of all this. Uh, so that's why we emphasize it so much. But uh, again, I do you know we also want people to do good homelessness prevention. We did a webinar that I think. Uh, talks about a lot of the sort of challenges with doing good homelessness prevention. Uh, and I think if you're looking to do a broad-based prevention program, using that treasury funding or resources that are much uh, sort of uh, match the scale of the need much better uh, is, is incredibly um, uh, helpful. Uh, so uh, definitely uh, we have both the issues of like just the moment right now, it is so important to rehouse as many people experiencing homelessness as possible. Uh, and that, uh, as again, as you'll see in that webinar we talked about, it's just so important uh, if you're going to do prevention, uh, it is very easy to fall into several traps around prevention and it's hard to uh, do it well. So uh, again, look at those webinars. We had a couple great webinars on rehousing uh, and prevention. So that takes us to the end of our time. We went a little over. I definitely want to thank our presenters today. Uh, for uh, coming on, Richard, Risa, and Thomas, you guys were great. Uh, a lot of great information, uh, and want to thank uh, uh, you know every Anne and uh, Tara, uh, also uh, providing great resources, and Natalie for uh, keeping all this stuff moving well, uh, and all the SNAP staff, and all you all out there that are doing such incredible work. I do want to say that we are not going to have an office hours next Friday. Uh, it is a uh, holiday, July 3rd, um, so we will return for office hours in two weeks. I believe that's July 10th, uh, and uh, we will probably be putting out a ton of information and who knows, may, may throw in a webinar or so uh, in between now and then, uh, but if not before, I will we'll definitely see you all on the 10th. Uh, I want to thank you all, and that concludes the webinar.